What is up, Bruce Linton? Welcome. Thank you so much for coming out. You're uh, coming in from Ottawa, Canada, fellow Canadian. Am I right? Indeed, Indeed, my man. And it's a nice sunny day in Ottawa, Canada, which is not typical for November. Hell yeah. Global warming is a rabbit hole in the conversation. We'll totally go into that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we don't have enough time for that. But you're you're born and raised in Ottawa. Well, I started in Ontario, so kind of like pseudo farmer growing up, which is a great way to become somewhat entrepreneurial because by default, I think anybody who lives in an agricultural kind of business, they have to be entrepreneurial because you don't know how it's going to go. And uh, that's just part of life. Yeah, there's a lot of different uh, things that can be thrown at you and knowing how to handle those things that are non-linear that that you can say. Um, I'm sure you face a lot of different things. Uh, You started uh, Canopy Growth Corp. You are the founder. How did how did you go from uh, working? You, I read that you went to school, but how did you go from transitioning, you know, building this uh, conglomerate, essentially? Well, it's, it's, um, it's weird, but I think sometimes it's hard for people to start businesses if they're super close to something. Um, and sometimes it's better to say, like, can I see, can I back up from the certainty of a, an opportunity and see it even bigger? And what I mean by that is, um, clearly, there's lots of people who want to have cannabis. And when I started this, there weren't very many people who were legally allowed to grow it. So you have this opportunity to be one of a few providing product to many. And so then you had to say, well, I like that idea, but who's the boss in deciding if we get to go somewhere and get to start something? And in the case of Canada in the early days and still today, to some extent, Health Canada, the bureaucrat. So the bureaucrat you don't become a bureaucrat because you want an exciting life. You become a bureaucrat because you'd like to go home at a certain time of day and you want a certain of a pension and you just don't want too crazy. So they're pretty risk averse people. Right. And so what we, what we really started off with was how can we make the bureaucrats the most confident that we're the best choice? And what that was, was showing that we had methods and systems that would result in them not being embarrassed, not being embarrassed because product disappeared not being embarrassed because it was, you know, uh, applied with products it couldn't be, sprays, chemicals, things that were disallowed. And so when I started into it, I was thinking, okay, it's a great business framework, but if you want to get really fast and get really far ahead, you have to kind of, you know, be the preferred licensee of the regulator because then they're going to work with you because they don't want to be embarrassed. Did you? So that, that was kind of the logic we used, right? And so we were very much in favor of, if they came to inspect us, can you ask us more questions so we really understand what you're thinking about? Right. Solve the problems that, you know, they would think of. Yeah. And so the effect of that was once you, you know, there's a, a saying that if you, have a, if you have a great start to something, you're about half done already. And so because we had a great start in getting licenses and confidence of regulators and momentum, it enabled us often to be the first or the second to have a new license, whether it was for extraction or expansion or, you know, additional locations, we were able to really work well with the regulators, which allowed us to put capital to work. So you could raise money and tell people how you're going to spend it. And you'd actually spend it in that way because you didn't get tripped up by the regulator. Uh, do you, did you have a mentor at the time to guide you through? No, it, it's probably a, a silly thing to say, but I think um, you should have a whole bunch of people. You ask a bunch of questions about things and they should be specialists in each of their field. So if you're a, you know, if you're making your way home and you during the day encountered a, a challenge with accounting or law or engineering, you should have a, a series of people that are almost on speed dial that you can contact and say, uh, this is what I, these are all the inputs I have. This is what I'm thinking about. What would your perception of that circumstance be? So I had a lot of those people around. Um, but in doing these things, a lot of times, um, we we're chatting just before we started, if you're going to be the leader, right? Not the CEO, but the leader. Um, a lot of the job of the leader is to be able to kind of keep it in your head, think it through, and then follow it through. The vision. You think it through and follow it through, and then others can join you. And so, you know, you spend a lot of your time talking to yourself essentially at you know three in the morning going, how are we going to do this? What's this going to turn out like? But um, that, that's either enjoyment or insanity. For my case, it was enjoyment. I, you know, that, that, that's a very positive space to be in. Yeah. 
you know, it's solitude and I, and I, in solitude breakthroughs happen and I, I can totally understand that. Well, I hate to interrupt you, but you know what I'm trying to find right now? And I've been Googling around on the solitude theme. I'm trying to find someone who wants their car driven to Florida. Cause like the idea of the old people fly down and I take two days hanging out with myself, driving their car down. Sounds just about perfect to think about a bunch of the topics that I'm thinking about, maybe have a, a chance just to go like all the way through the idea. So I actually am trying to find someone who wants their car driven to Florida, which is ridiculous. Just right? so like, you can know, so you could just have that time. I mean, yeah. when you explain it, I totally understand. I actually went to music school because my parents put the pressure of like you work or you're in school or you're kicked out of the house. And I did get kicked out of the house, <laughs> but I went to school because I wanted to, uh, you know, I, it took, I got to utilize the time, you know, I, yeah, it was great, but you know, I got to time to figure out um, avenues that I could take to be successful in, in, you know, music field, certain, certain ways. And so I can totally, I can totally resonate with that. And uh, it is very important is now it, on that note, is would you say this is a part of a, a routine? Do you have a routine that that you wake up and that you do every morning or every week? Uh, um, I know you. Have I never did. That well, I never did before COVID. Right, my routine in COVID was to just think about what had to be done and whatever that meant, do it. So, if you meant jumping on a plane to Germany, or it meant being uh, in the building Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever. Um, and so eating, whatever, sleeping, whenever, um, traveling, whenever, like I never had a pattern at all. And the effect of that was I um, got a lot done, but I got kind of like fat and out of shape. And uh, I was super tired and I had no idea. So when COVID hit, I actually went, hmm, I'm like 35 pounds too fat. What should I do about that? So then I started thinking about a pattern. What do I eat for breakfast? So every day, every day. I now have berries, yogurt, ground up hemp, ground up flax, and chia every wow. day. And I actually try to go to bed at or about the same time every night. And I try to do uh, every, th- every second day some exercise. And the effect of that is um, I don't think I've felt as focused or able to be energetic or just as... Um, I don't know, physically good and 15 years. Less sluggish. (laughs) Yeah. You know, the the only problem that's a bad side, there's there's always a good side and a bad side to everything. The bad side of getting less fat is you look older because you get a bit more (laughs) wrinkled. The skin like sucks to your face. Yeah. Yeah. Like (laughs) when, when 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 you don't have cheekbones, just round face, your skin's nice and tight. Uh, Jolly. And so I had somebody today to me go, I I didn't really recognize you because you look a lot older. So, well, I, I'll take that as the bad part of not being as uh, 35 pounds fat. Cause like, I'm not a super tall guy when you're five, nine <laughs> and you're tanking around 35 pounds of extra weight, it's not a, it's not uh it's everywhere. Right. You can't say, well, I was just fat on my wrist. No, no, you don't you, smoke you know, cigarettes. No, I did once. So like you should do everything once I smoked six in one day, threw up and went, that's note to file. I'm not good at that. <laughs> not good at that. Yeah. <laughs> That'll do it. That'll do it. You, you yeah. don't vape. You never tried to vape. I've tried it. I, I, it's um, so totally to be totally transparent in, inhalation of anything. So I grew up with a dad who was a smoker. He was a cigarette smoker and then he transitioned to a pipe smoker uh, and then he transitioned to a not smoker. But I can tell you, like we probably spent um, up until age 12 or 14 bringing home pictures of like black lungs from cigarettes and why you shouldn't smoke and getting in the car and everybody gets in the car and before he could move. Then he's got to start the cigarette or the pipe. And you'd sit in the car and you'd be coughing like so smoke and me don't hang out together very much because that was not the best. Like, hey, okay, everybody get in the car. We're going somewhere. Okay, now I got to fire up my cigarette before we can drive out the laneway. Right. And that was back in the day. So, hey, leave your windows up. I don't want it getting cold in here. Um, You know, that kind of (laughs) shit. Um, So you're stuck in the smoke trap. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so that 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 definitely has makes you to have an opinion. that I'm not like super fond of smoke, Um, which partially was what drove me when I was at Canopy to say that, you know, I think society has so many um, ways people expect to enjoy things that are intoxicants, pleasure, you know, relaxants. And the biggest and best one is if you're at a concert outdoors, right? Like if you say, well, what's one of the nicest days you have in a summer? 
sloping grass hill, listening to music played live by a variety of artists you like, and ideally sipping away on a cannabis beverage, not, not sure. beers. And, and so like that, that whole thing to me felt like it would be a great on-ramp for people to like beverages. And then bars are designed like in Canada, you're in Canada, a lot of people you may listen to you aren't in Canada, trying to find a place to smoke a cigarette or a joint is increasingly close to impossible. Right. Getting a lot hotter. Yeah. Yeah. And you feel self-conscious even when I'm walking, I'm like, it's yeah. But to have a beverage, there are more and more places opening called bars and outdoor concerts. So I just think that the beverage angle and the reason I advocated for is it's just socially less friction. Right. You know, and you know, the new people, there's, there's different types of people. Like uh, I, I'm a, I use a lot more than uh, your average user and the average. Well, call yourself user, above average. So think of yourself as above average. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, baby. I like that. <laughs> So, you're, you know, the new people who are getting into it, guess what they're going to get into? They're going to get into the drinks and, and the edibles. And, and, you know, I lived in an environment where smoking was ugh, the same thing. It's like wake up to cigarette smoke. It, it turned me off to you know, cigarettes completely. But I don't know if you've used some of the uh, the heat not burn. So obviously, you know, we had uh, stored some Bickle variety of lines. Um, but we also one of the companies I'm involved with is called Lemura. And I like it because it's essentially what they do is you, you pre-fill the stick. The stick fits inside the heating device. And what you have is a filter in your mouth and it's a heat not burn and it works great. It's, it's super on point and quick to the temperature that's optimal. Doesn't you now you're not you now you're not burning. You're Vape. just heating and you, it, it works fantastic. It's very portable. So I've been helping those guys a bit because I just think there's going to be um, there's a bunch of rental environments. You, you know, you talked about renting rooms. Yes. You probably have a rule, believe it or not. I bet you have a rule that says you can't smoke in your, your, the room you rent them. Of course. Right. But you could heat, not burn. Yeah. 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 You could vape. That's totally fine. Because it doesn't stick. The, the car yeah. doesn't, you know, create a tar. And yeah. The tar. So like that, those are the sorts of things. A lot of times if you, if you say like, do I want to change the world or do I want to fit into the world with the change I want? And that's why when you think about beverages, you can fit into the world with the change you want rather than changing all the smoking laws. Like, hey, you got to allow me to have a smoking lounge. Just, uh, you'll never win that argument in Canada for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's funny. My father and I were uh, we invested in Tweed at like two dollars. <laughs> like we got in like super early, man. <laughs> like I, I just. I felt something so good about it. You know, I, I like to be in tune with the zeitgeist of things. Um, even I even finding red light Holland at six cents is, is, yep. you know, super grateful for that. Like super dope. Uh, and even following you around, do you have a favorite strain that, that you're, so it, I'll give you my canned answer because I'm not, um, I'm think of me more as a milligrams guy, right? Beverages. Okay. Yeah. Edibles grams guy. But in the early days of canopy tweed, um, we had all these shit, shit. We had genetics on genetics on genetics. What we didn't have with them was any domain knowledge of what, 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 the, what did we buy? <laughs> right. You just bought, you just, like, we just okay, had everything like, and they were all marked, but like they were all marked by well meaning people, but everybody would say, well, this is my whatever Kush. This is my whatever hair. But they were all, if you planted, if you planted, if you cracked four seeds from each of the genetic groups you got and you put them in a room, well, shit, you, there was no commonality between any of them. And so we, we worked through genetics and, you know, powder and mildew cycles and things that were like herming like crazy. And just so finally, we had one strain we got stabilized and it was a, a, a Kush variant that finally grew. We could harvest and we could actually reliably reproduce the same thing with the cuttings. And it was pretty durable to powdery mildew. Like it was in the early days. And so these people would say, well, which strain is that? And I said, well, that one, because it's the only one we know how to grow. Pink Kush? Yeah. So was it, no, it wasn't a pink, it was another fish, but the, the effect of what is um, when you're on the business side of it, what you're trying to figure out is without the ability to use any of the sprays, right? Like everybody will say they never spray their plants. I guarantee you when we tested all these plants that we bought as live genetics, they all had residuals on them. Like we didn't. <laughs> And, and sure so, it's not from nutrients. Would nutrients cause that? Well, oh, fuck. Some, of the, some of the nutrients do because they have all these unmarked ingredients in them, right? right. And some, some of the, you know, some of the folks that will spray things up to flower, but they'll say didn't spray it when there's flower. It's still actually residual on the plant. So what we had to do is we were basically using 
nice, fast moving air. And maybe a little like baking soda kind of powder stuff to try and keep the, but like we had no, we couldn't use even things like um, approved products now. Really? Yeah. So? Oh yeah. So God. in an approved products, in, when we first came out, there were almost no approved products, which you could apply to a cannabis plant. Whoa, no way. But yeah, I mean, it's clean. <laughs> super clean. Like people say, you know, uh, I don't like, I'm like, listen, this stuff is super clean. The building's clean. The stuff can't be in. So that, that kind of was like uh, our genetics evolution. And, you know, we, we went through many iterations, right? We, we, we had the first greenhouse in the sector. So when you open up a greenhouse, well, why don't we just ship cuttings of every kind of plant we have? We shipped down a dozen different options to grow. Shit, within a month, about half of them were like, I hate it in a greenhouse. This is not for me. They were freaking out. So you have to kill and you work your way through it. Right. So right. you trial strange. and error with genetics, essentially. Yeah. And then you start to appreciate like the guys like Don and Aaron from DNA, DNA Genetics. Yeah. I've these guys have dedicated their whole life to strains, to evolutions of strains. Like these, you know, I That's see people. Hear. Oh, they're, they're amazing. Like there's a reason they won so many um, cannabis cups is because, and you know, even cookies, look at cookies. What they continue yeah, to trying to do is have up. new drops with new evolution. So I think, um, I think the, one of the exciting things that's going to happen with cannabis is going to be the continual advancement in breeding and the genetics that come out, whether it's an acceleration of creating better terpene profiles, you know, it's not going to just be like one of the companies I'm involved with uh, has this black mamba testing out at like 32, 33%. And the guy growing it is like, people line up for it, but he goes, man, unless you're Snoop Dogg, you probably should not be grabbing hold of this. Um, <laughs> right. Oh, really mess. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah, not for the beginning, uh, beginner. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so which one is, so what's, so what's your preferred way of consumption? So, so my favorite, two, two, two things that I think are just, and you know, they're seasonally different, but like this, this summer, having the cannabis beverages, if you looked in our fridge, instead of having a bunch of cans of beer, even though it was a pain in the ass, we had always all the various tweed products. And when I say it's a pain in the ass, right? If you go to the, the store and to buy them, you can only buy four at a time. And you got to walk up, put them in your car. Oh, no way. Right. Again. And, and they're stupid expensive, right? Like they were, you know, depending uh, on which one you get, but think you're, you know, it's five or six bucks. In my opinion, they should be priced essentially the same price as having a beer, maybe an imported beer. Yeah, two or There's three enough. bucks. Right. So that's that, what that I paid for. Mine. But so I like that for a couple of reasons. One is um, if you're drinking them, you're not getting dehydrated. If you're drinking them, you're not getting fatter. Because they're, you know, they're either zero calories or one or two. You're not getting pasties, right? Yeah, but you think about it, like a lot of people buy these, um, you know, white clone, these other products that have 100 calories in it. What I found is like zero calories is a lot less than 100. And so <laughs> 100. like, yeah. yeah, but you can have, so you can have those beverages. And I thought, um, depending on, you know, if it's a hot day and you got the uh, houseplant grapefruit, phenomenal, refreshing drink. Like it just, it feels they like you're very nice. Out sipping. But, um, so I, I like that, but I also... Um, I've been using, or we've been using the uh, Omira product in terms of just stuff your own stick with whatever you buy, but it's, it's great because you're not, I'm not combusting. It just goes in, heats up, you draw on it. And so you're not vaping. You're, you're having a heat, not burn. Is I of course. Oh, Omira. Yeah. So I of oh, course have like, um, I have the gold plated, uh, you know, anniversary uh, Sturz and Bickle Vicano, but nice. you're not going to, you're not going to, I don't need to fire that thing up all the time. Right. Th that's it's, <laughs> You no, know, it's not convenient. Yeah. So, you know, you have the, the mighty and things, but really, I think Amir has done a good job with their product. Yeah. Yeah. I'm checking it out right now. It's um, for people who don't know what it is. It's uh, it's literally a, an electrical device that looks like an egg, but you just put a stick in it and then yep. you just suck it. And you yeah. Turn it on and you so it, it's it. like the Ico cigarettes. You see this in Europe and Asia all over the place where people aren't smoking nicotine anymore. They're using this and it heats, not burns the nicotine, but you still have the filter in your mouth. Philip Morris is, uh, yeah, it's doing, has it with their tobacco. This is so really like, interesting. Yeah. And these guys, most of them came from uh, Japan, tobacco, Philip Morris, they're all industrial designers and experts out of that field. And they created their own uh, version of it that doesn't infringe on patents and it works great. Hell yeah. It's, it's innovative. That's what I like. It's hard yeah. being innovative because you know, you're, you're, you're a taste maker and you're, you're trying to get people into new things that you're like, <laughs> you know, is good, but it's just, you know, you could be ahead of the curve. 
Yeah. Well, and the thing, their business model is sensible because the device is very inexpensive. Then what they do is they license all of their, their sticks to various producers who pay oh, them nice. a small percent. So they fill them and sell them in the dispensaries and they get, they get a small carry on every stick. Yeah, that's super clever. Did you think of that or did they think? No, they did. And, you know, it's a great model. And then when they have uh, geographies where they can't pre-fill, they'll sell them and you can fill them yourself. Um, You use the same stick maybe two or three times and it's time for another one. So, you know, you might uh, buy a pack of them and you might pay five bucks for the pack, but it lasts quite a while. So they have a business model that keeps making the money, not not a one and done. Yeah. Well, what would you recommend for new cannabis entrepreneurs starting out? Um, what would be, I think, I think, I think everybody wants to tell you, oh, brands are everything or this or that, uh, right now where I'm seeing the opportunity is what, what products you don't need to grow to make products. So you can make, um, you can make anything you want. You think the customer wants. So now why do you think the customer wants it? What problem are you solving? And one of the smartest things I've seen are these, um, you know, essentially they're in free infused Mm pre-rolls. So they're probably taking grade C cannabis. They're taking a variety of other products, Keef, and, and pulling some terpenes, maybe from a, a flash frozen. And then they make these pre-rolls so that you think, man, this is the best stuff I've ever had, <laughs> right? And so the effect of that is you've made multiple m- solutions to multiple people's problems. Right. And it was the cheapest way that you can get. <laughs> right. So like, that's the kind of thing when you say, what should they be doing? They should be thinking about what are the biggest problems in the sectors and what are my workaround strategies to make a product that's unique and different? Um, and that one is like, it's not so new anywhere, but it is so smart because it oh, takes the, it takes all the so pressure clever. off the grow. So clever. So clever. I mean, as a, I could see a lot of people being like, oh, we're not getting the full buds or like sticklers <laughs> essentially. <laughs> you know what? It's the hottest product because if you're smart, you can actually continually create a, a, a pretty uniform product. You can actually make it so that it is both um, impactful, but flavorful. Yeah. And, and so like stuff like that. So there's a couple of companies out there doing sort of aggressive innovation. One of them just merged with um, Green Organic Dutchman called Cruzy. And so okay. these guys, they're not, they weren't trying to be growers. They, they brought Wild to Canada. So, you know, Wild, as far as a brand in America, what are they doing? Like 150, 200 million bucks a year in revenue. They're, they're, they're a meaningful, uh, meaningful player in terms of the edibles. And so these guys are just bringing things here and then getting strong so that they can then go to the U.S. with financial strength. Mm-hmm. That's, that sounds super interesting, especially with uh, legalization coming in uh, America, you know. Someday. Someday. Be careful what you wish for, though. Like, oh, we're hoping the government shows up and makes this better. That doesn't always work out. Right. That, well, that's interesting because you're on the legal side of things and there's obviously a black market and there's a white market. And, you know, you're a proprietor and you're, you know, I, I respect, you know, you know, clean cannabis and doing things right. You know, you have to play by certain rules, you know, to be successful. And, you know, I'm in the same boat and that's why I can respect well, that. You're in Toronto um, where you are is a little bit North of queen, but like, I don't know how many um, retail locations are open in your particular street, but when we were chatting before the show, like Tokyo, Smoke. why would you bother buying shit from somewhere else? Especially if you're new to the show, you never would. When there's retail locations everywhere and they're not all the same, everybody says all the the same. They aren't, they may have similar products, but they have very, very different. uh, I'll call it vibe when you walk in. Oh, how they run their show. Completely different brands. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. I, uh, I've helped out a a couple uh, places start up uh, their company. And uh, okay. So, but do you uh, even just don't stay on that? Yesterday, one of the coolest announcements I've seen in a while was that Uber is going to let you order at, at Tokyo Smoke and you can come get it. But really what they're doing is they said, we're warming up. If you can order through the Uber app, your weed to pick up at Tokyo Smoke, all it takes is one legislative change. And now you can order and Uber delivers it. Oh, that's so unreal. That would and be so, crazy. you know, everybody's uh, everybody's idea that, <laughs> you know, they're going to be like Uber. They're going to be like Amazon. They're going to be like, no. Those guys are going to be who they are. And you better think about when they come in the game, do you have a play? What's going to happen? Right. Exactly. Right. So People like probably yesterday right. was not the happiest day ever for ease. Right. 
oh, Uber's now sort of actually in the game. Son of a gun. That's not super awesome if you're ease. And like, you know, a lot of these people making uh, workarounds for banking, those are dead the minute the banks can do the deal. Right. Loans and stuff. Yeah. I don't care if it's some of these guys in the US that take 12, 15 percent interest rates on securing cannabis buildings. If it's um, folks that are charging outrageous rates as far as a transaction clearing platform, all that stuff just goes to zero the second the real players can come in. And so like Uber saying you can now order weed. Oh, my God. Still pick it up at Tokyo Smoke. But that is a big frigging deal. The change It's a big change. It's a bit, you know, people have to be able to, uh, I think in Toronto, <laughs> you know, people are a little bit more liberal, you know, to the th- idea. Well, yeah, but you think about how many people are already already delivering weed in Toronto on bikes, on electric bikes with cars. That's all illegal. So now if I'm a politician, do I want to turn a blind eye to that or do I want to let Uber do it legit? What makes the most money? <laughs> They're going to get taxes on it versus not taxes. So uh, my only point is, I think if you're an entrepreneur and you're seeking to be involved in a sector, you have to say, I need to have a, a perspective on where I think it's going. And it's better to be wrong betting on what you think where it's going than to play like the same game as 500 other folks. Like, well, how many licensed producers are there in Canada now? Like five, 600? I have no idea. Like right. that's probably a super bad idea now, unless you actually just want to do a craft grow by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I actually was able to buy $2 drinks beat from dispensaries that were closing down and it's cr- yeah. kind of crazy to see the infrastructure that canopy has is super cool. You're still involved with the company, but you're well, not-, not really. Right. Like when they fire me, um, that makes me not so involved. So I'm, I'm a supporter of the brands and I'm a supporter of the people that I'd hired but um, okay. maybe if, you could have been involved low key. You know, I don't know. No, no. Listen, I am. Um, if I were, if I had the job of firing me the day they, they fired me, I would have, I think done as good or better job than they did because I would have said, okay, we should fire me if you want to fire me, but we should think about who's replacing me. So there's no complete absence for a period of time because that causes people stress. Oh, they didn't think about that. Eh? Yeah. And you should maybe say like, is there some residual value? Like would the guys at acreage like him to come down and run acreage? Maybe this guy could anything like, that didn't allow you to not work at other. Things. Well, no, I could do that, but I, I'm saying like, uh, so I have no connection to the company because the company didn't want me to have a connection. Oh my and, god! So they gave you away like an asset, essentially. <laughs> well, they said get out of here. But you know, the funny part is, um, and it's sad because I cheer for the people who work there. But like, I think when I was doing a terrible job, we had about twenty six and a half percent market share, and I think now they have about eight percent market share in two and a half years later, which brings down the value. Yeah. And so like when you see it, you say, well, everybody's losing. No, no. Organogram uh, announced how they're doing today and their market share has gone up quite a lot year over year. Yeah. 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 And so I like on my list in their product, I like as well. Yeah. You know what? They, they had problems with their growth. They made it bigger. They got it locked down. Now they have, you know, they've had a couple of good CEOs. Another person who's the CEO now is good, good at what she does. I think they, and they keep coming up with new products in new categories. You know what? We all love trying new shit. Like you're going to go buy what you're going to go buy, but you almost never buy just more of what you already know. You always end up picking something new up. That's why my, uh, my DJ name is modern. <laughs> or my stage name is modern. You know, people are always looking for the new stuff. The modern. Right. So, you know, that that means the obligation on the company is to create new stuff. Oh yeah. They have to be with the current. Yeah. Cause you know, look at just, they announced we made more SKUs, new SKUs and our, we took market share. Those things correlate. Do you, how do you feel about the two, the, the low milligrams in the edibles and the. Yeah. People want at least 10 milligrams in a beverage minimum how do because you like the he- he- Hexo was number one market share in, in beverages because pretty much other beverages are just 10 milligrams straight up, not more costly than buying two milligrams. Kind of get that. Like now you buy one drink, not four. Um, hmm, okay. Um, I do think 10 in a serving isn't bad. Like I've been seeing things over the last call it 10 years where um, I think it was Brendan Kennedy, the guy that was the uh, founder of uh, Privateer. I asked me like, what's the craziest product you ever saw? He saw a thousand milligram chocolate bar. Can you imagine? Like how fucking bad idea is that? It's cr- well, bad idea. I mean, you could break a little bit off and have a little bit. Oh, of- yeah, you could. Theoretically, you could. Yeah, you probably would be perfectly. So, like, I, I think, you know, I was in um, 
Arizona and they have 100 milligram single serving beverages. Like it looks like it's a can looks that's like a, a beer. that's a little. Yeah, but, but you still like at the end of the day, I think it's better to have more good stories than bad stories. Right. Because the it, market's still forming. And so I think it's still better to keep a 10 milligram upper limit that you can buy more containers of 10 milligrams. Like I should be able to buy all the cans I want of 10 milligram beverages. I shouldn't, it costs me, but I shouldn't have to go in and out of the store because I got four and I got to put them in my car and go back in and get another four. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, why I wanted to get your opinion on it. I, so I, like, I, I just think, but if we think long-term, isn't it better until everybody knows what they're doing? Cause in a sense, much of Canada is still like a 17 year old who's stealing booze from their parents' liquor cabinet. They have no clue what they were doing. And they get loaded thinking that drinking, um, a lot of cherry whiskey is a good idea and that, or, or some gin. And then for the rest of their life, they hate the shit because they just destroyed themselves once when they're 17. I think yeah. we're better until everybody gets comfortable and confident to stay a little bit uh, in the a smaller strike zone. You're very right. And as a, like a society and knowing where we at as a society, you know, it's it, being conscious of that, I think, and you having that perspective is super smart because, you know, if you're going to have a, bad experience the first time you try something it's going to be a turn off and that's the way it's been for the past yep. how many hundreds of years yeah so. yeah you know it's always the if i the number of stories of wow my friend made some of this stuff and we were destroyed for like half a day well that doesn't create a repeat customer exactly right you want them to eat so you know who stuff. actually wins then booze Booze. Yeah, exactly. Because it's safe. They're like, oh, yeah, it's safe. I could just drink it. It's safe. Beer. I'm just going to go back to sipping wine because I got too destroyed. No, no, that's actually bad. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because people see it's knowing too much. You, you separate yourself from the average user. And then I forget. I like, I, I quickly forget that, you know, when I go out, I'm like, wow, yeah, people don't smoke two grams a day or do people don't smoke they don't even smoke weed <laughs> you know they're just yeah. trying it yeah no i think and, and it is um you know it, it is important like if we're going to have uh, a durable evolution it can't it can't just be a switching of supply from the guys who've been buying for 10 years it, it's got to be a whole bunch more people feel comfortable confident so i'm really looking forward when they start having they're going to have cannabis only concerts. They were going to have them this past summer if concerts were a thing without COVID. So you could basically buy cannabis beverages, not alcohol beverages. That's the kind of thing that starts just completely changing the world, right? People, people say, hey, you know what? I had a great time that day. I'm just moving out of the sun. I had a great time that day. This is what I'm, I'm not going to the liquor store and buying whatever. I'm going to go buy these. Uh, it's not a toxin. Uh, like, it's crazy. I had a conversation, a conversation with someone and in my mind, I'm, when someone says weed is a drug, I get like almost offended. I'm like, ah, weed is a drug. Like it's not a drug, but and I'm like, is alcohol a drug? Yeah. And then it is. They're, they're all, but then you say, but, but is it a depressant? No, it is not. So like, you know, when you start saying alcohol is a depressant, right? It's a big fat molecule designed to be a depressant. And the only way you can make it is basically in a highly calorific form factor right, because okay. it needs so like, anyhow, there's just so much better, but we should keep going. Cause I know that I'm now about 10 minutes late for something. Olivia is going to say, I've rescheduled that person. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Um, any words of wisdom, any sh companies you want to shout out, um, big players, you know, maybe some tips, you know, I'm always uh, investing my, uh, well, <laughs> small, so, so surprise small things that have surprised me over the last little while. Like I wasn't sure that Village Farms was a big idea or a good idea, but they seem to be one of the few people with greenhouses that are making it work. So if you look at Village Farms, they actually had good product, good, good sell through. Organogram, I keep, I've always liked them. And I think I like them more now because I just see them being super innovative. Um, you know, it, it's um, now we're going to see, I think speaking, learning to speak German, if you're a cannabis entrepreneur will be a good idea because Germany will have a rational market for recreational way before America even decides what to do. Right. They're legalizing. Right. And when they legalize it, you think Germans are, are crappy at organizing things are really good. So it'll be super organized. It'll, it'll go on clockwork. You'll be able to actually know what's going on and it'll happen. There'll be no monkey business. And when the Germans do it, does that give a green light to pretty much mm, like if Italy or say Greece said, well, you know, we've been thinking about it, but we were a little reluctant. Once Germany does it, can they do it? hundred percent. So all of a sudden you have more people in Europe than you have in the US and they have way more accelerated models for doing it. So like my enthusiasm for Europe 
has always been high. It's much higher. Like German is the perfect, like if, if some crappy country did it first in, in Europe, it wouldn't work well. Germany is the best to do right. that. Cause I even just, that. yeah. So With like, I, I just think Europe's going to be a riot. Um, there'll be more reasons to go uh, over and like, no one would have Amsterdam is lovely, but there's its entire tourism base was based on like Las Vegas on gambling, Amsterdam on, uh, you know, the shops. Uh, I think the big net loser out of a lot of this stuff are places like Amsterdam. Right. Because it's just a tourist attraction rather than a uh, full fledged industry. Right. Yeah. OK, be well. Yeah, man, thank with you, you so much. Is there any uh, companies that you of yours that you want to? Well, I, so I'm, I'm involved uh, trying to make sure things like Red Light Holland keep being aggressive and looking for edgy things to buy. Um, yeah. Pretty busy. Uh, Gage is just finishing up becoming part of TerraSense. So that's going to be a next chapter, which I think the guys from Gage are just going to bring the growing quality and capabilities across TerraSense way up. Nice. And so um, I think that'll be a fun watch to see go out. But uh, no, I'm, I'm, um, I'm increasingly... Um, trying to make sure that what I'm doing is thinking about the next things to do. Cause I've had two and a half years of cycling a lot of these up, like things I'm still trying to work through and make really good. I, I love the guys at slang and I love their portfolio, but their stocks crappy, but I still think these guys are successful in markets like Oregon and Colorado, which are the super competitive ones because they're the most evolved. If you can be successful there, I think your applicability is going to be very high everywhere soon. Right. Cause then you can branch out and web out. Yeah, so Something. slang, I keep working with those guys every week because they, their best markets are the hardest markets in the world. That's really cool. I'm excited to see uh, what you come up with. I'm sure everyone else okay. is as well. well, man. I'll Thanks. have Bye-bye. to uh, send you uh, some Dollar pay Club papers so you can try those Please. out. Please. Yeah, man. Okay, thank you. Be good. Bye. Ciao. Bye-bye.